Hi folks, welcome to Diorama Rama. This is my third time doing this panel for the Southern California Gundam modeling competition. I'm happy to be glad to back, even if it is just for a virtual pre-recorded panel. Uh, I am doing a pre-recorded panel this year rather than doing it live because I'm going to do a bit more hands-on demonstration stuff that takes a lot longer than this panel would actually allow for. Nobody wants to sit around watching resin dry for eight hours. Do you? Should I just stream resin drying for eight hours? Let me know. I might do that. Could be fun. Anyway, as you can see in front of me here, I've got this uh, Mega Size Zaku 2. Uh, this is just kind of hastily thrown together just so I can have it built for a reference for the project that I'm mainly going to be focusing on in this panel. Uh, why did I choose a Mega Size? Why the hell not? I like big stuff. So I went with the biggest I could get, and nobody was selling the 112. I want to sell me a 112 so I can do a diorama with it. Alright, so one thing I've noticed with a lot of my builds is that uh, they're getting hard to display because I like to do big dioramas. You may have seen them before at SCGMC uh, or here on the screen. Behold, editing magic. Woo! Anyway, uh, so this time uh, I made sure to grab one of my shelves for one of the IKEA cabinets that I use, which is a Vesta. Uh, this one is obviously still in its wrapping. So. But what I did was I took a piece of plywood and I cut it to size so that it would be, conveniently enough, the right size. So, now I have my baseboard. And I know that it'll be big enough to fit within my shelf. Uh, so, I know I can build based on that. And basically what I want to do is I'm going to have the Zaku 2 over here in the corner. I'm going to have a small creek, river, water reservoir sort of thing going on running along here. And a, a road leading up to the encampment with some Xeon soldiers there which I've got a bunch of uh, 148 uh, soldiers, so those will be placed there. I'll build up a little encampment, put a couple of them will be working on maintenance thing for this thing, uh, and the Zaku will be painted and weathered to go along with all of it. And there will also be a bit of a, a cliff side behind the Zaku here, uh, just so it's not all just like a flat plane. Now, to do that build up, though, I'm going to need something to build up with. Uh, and the best thing that I find for that uh, is extruded polystyrene, uh, which is these pink foam sheets that you can pick up at any home improvement store. Uh, you might be able to find one on Amazon as well. Uh, generally speaking, like Home Depot and Lowe's will sell you them in big four foot by eight foot sheets, uh, which are great if one, you have a car that can carry that and not like a VW Beetle. Uh, or if you're building like a wargaming terrain and you need that massive footprint for it. Uh, for most dioramas though, you're probably not going to need that much and it's going to be just more convenient to not get a huge sheet of it. Thankfully they also do sell these convenient two foot by two foot uh, segments of it for like five bucks. So that's what I did, is I bought a bunch of those. Uh, I cut one down to the size of the board already just to have it ready to go. Uh, now, I'm going to also, before I do anything else, uh, take a box cutter here, which is what I use to cut out the initial shape of this, and I'm just going to lightly score uh, some basic design work into where I want everything, really, just to give me a, a placement idea. Now, I haven't glued this down yet, uh, which I'll do in a minute. But I want to do this first, so if I screw it up, I can flip it over and use the other side. Or grab another sheet, or whatnot. That's how this works. So I'm going to start with the creaky river bed. It's not going to be too terribly large, but it is, you know, 148 scale, so it is going to be 
a little big. If this was like a 1144 scale thing, it would definitely be a river. But since it's only 148, it's more of a, a creek. Uh, I am going to do some water effects, so you'll be able to see that in a little bit when I get to it. Uh, and I'm just taking several light passes. Uh, you want to use, make sure to use a nice, sharp, fresh blade when you're doing this. It gives you a much better cut. I'm not. Uh, but you want to make sure to do it, because, you know, do as I say, not as I do. You should also not cut toward yourself. That's also a very bad thing. And once again, one of those, do as I say, not as I do. But it does honestly give me better control if I cut toward myself because it's only it's easier to push it. So be careful. Don't cut your fingers off. Don't tell my husband I did this. I'm sure he's watching them. generally want to try to get this as smooth as you can. Sometimes the, the blade will kick a bit, and that's okay. You can still fix this later, and we're going to do a lot of stuff to go over this, so it doesn't matter really how rough it currently looks, as long as you kind of get what you're, you're going for. Not throw this off here on the floor, that would be bad. I want you kind of to get it cut, and not you can kind of break it apart like so. Now I've got my water section cut out like so. Pretty easy. I'm gonna go back over this edge to give it a little bit more of an angle. And also just kind of smooth out some of those birds. Also recommend using a better knife than this one, because this one doesn't want to really keep the blade locked, and that's kind of annoying when you're trying to cut stuff at a you know, a desired length or angle. Now, this will also make a huge mess, uh, which everything that you will see me do today will likely result in a massive mess. Uh, so make sure that uh, if you care about the floor of the room in which you're doing this in, unlike me, uh, you make sure to put light on a knife, a draw cloth, or some newspaper or something, just to, to catch anything that might spill or fall and whatnot. Uh, otherwise, you can prepare to do a lot of vacuuming later. I intend to replace the floor in this office at some point, so I don't care. As you can see, I've got that there. And what I'm going to use to tack this down now is uh, called styro glue. Uh, it's a it's glue it's meant for styrofoam, which is, is fundamentally styrofoam. Uh, so I'll just use this to tack it down. This is basically a PVA. It dries clear. Uh, you could use Elmer's glue. You could use wood glue. You could use spray adhesive. Uh, you could use styrofoam. Yeah, styrofoam. Uh, super glue. Say you can use spray adhesive, but generally you don't want to, because uh, aerosol will react to uh, foam like this, uh, and it will uh, emit some nice toxic fumes. So you want to make sure that you're in a nice, well ventilated area. You're going to deal with that, uh, and want to do it later. So generally, it's better to use a liquid glue. 
a liquid glue. to this um, to make sure everything stays in place and is nice and happy, grabbing some random objects from off my table here. And this will take a little bit to dry, so we'll be back in a moment. So as you can see, I've laid out the foam and gotten in pretty much where I want it to be. Nice tack down. I added a little bit more to the side as well to give me kind of a mountainy build up uh, behind the Zaku. Just to add a bit more interest over there. Uh, next, I'm going to be uh, doing the actual initial ground layer. Uh, for this, I will uh, be using a product called sculpt mold uh, this is a, a powder uh, that gets activated by water. Uh, there's a number of things you could use for this. Uh, I've used drywall joint compound in the past. Uh, plaster cloth is also very good. Um, this has a, a, a fiber built into it, like mixed into the, the powder. Uh, so it gives a lot of structure and rigidity. And all you have to do is just mix it up with water. You want it to get to kind of a moist consistency, not too soggy, not too dry. Uh, it might take you a little bit to get the gist of what exactly you need, but hey, play with it a bit. Uh, one benefit that it does have to the other methods though, is that you can make up as much or as little as you need at a time. Uh, and as you can see here, I'm just kind of spreading it around uh, with my hands. You want to make sure you're wearing gloves because it will get messy and get everywhere. Uh, but that's true for any of the methods I mentioned. Uh, and just basically just kind of pat it down into wherever you need it to be. Spread it out as best you can. Uh, you don't want to really slide your can around too much because you will you will pull it up and off. Uh, so just kind of dab it into place with your fingers and sculpt out however you, uh, you want it to be done. Uh, because it has the fibers built into it, it will actually allow for a bit of an overhang and uh, build out from any structure that you've pre-built. Uh, so that lets you get a little bit of those nice kind of uh, rocky walls and whatnot that you would expect to see in nature. I just keep building it up and building it up and building it up. If you're like me and you work in a, uh, a studio with an overhead fan, make sure you turn it off uh, while you're doing this, uh, or else you'll get uh, little bits of powder just kind of strewn about the entire room. Don't ask me how I know about this. Just 
learn from my experiences. For the riverbed section, uh, I make sure to really pack it into the, uh, the sides uh, to create a good seal. Uh, you want to try to make sure both when you're gluing and when you're doing this step uh, that uh, the resin that you're going to be pouring later doesn't get uh, underneath the, the, the foam structure because uh, then it has the potential of leaking out and creating a giant mess. And you won't know until you start and it's too late. So just be careful. One other thing I probably should have done before I did this layer was uh, score up the foam a little bit just to give a little bit more um, grip for the the sculptable to grab onto. Uh, it's not 100% necessary, just one of those little things that can be helpful. You can start to see the buildup on my gloves, which is definitely the reason why I wear gloves, because otherwise that's all on my hand, and that's significantly more of a pain in the ass to have to clean in between refilling and whatnot, because you don't want to get moisture into your bag of sculpting mold and ruin the whole rest of the batch, because kind of defeats the purpose of uh, using it in the first place over, say, plaster or uh, drywall compound. For this last batch of uh, sculpt mold mixture, I did go heavier on the water in the mix. Uh, this uh, gives it, it makes it uh, take longer to cure in those sections, uh, and it loses a bit of the the rigidity that you would get from uh, having less water. So it doesn't work as well for doing overhanging structure work, but it's really good for uh, just covering up these last few sections where I just need to, to fill in some spots.
so for this next stage, I'm using a mixture of uh, three parts water, one part uh, Mod Podge uh, to uh, Mod Podge mat to make a, a scenic glue, and I will be spraying a variety of uh, ballast, uh, small rocks uh, over the area to give it a more of a, a natural texture. The, the sculpting mold creates a nice rocky look to it, but this will create more of a, a natural dirt look to it and uh, help tr transition between different forms of ground terrain. I also have a spray bottle of isopropyl alcohol. Uh, that was fun trying to get in a pandemic, but hey, I, I got some. Uh, so what that does is you spray it onto the rocks before doing a layer of scenic cement. Um, and it helps the cement uh, break the surface tension and uh, get pulled down into in between the different rocks, uh, giving you a stronger, better hold. And you basically just you're going to coat the whole damn thing in both glue and alcohol throughout doing this. Uh, make sure to be in a ventilated area because, you know, you don't want to just be breathing in alcohol constantly. Now, if I was fancy, I'd make a, a proper spreader out of a uh, spray bottle, a, a spray can cap, and a uh, piece of pantyhose. But I'm not that fancy, so I just kind of shift it around carefully with my hand. Uh, the spray bottle I'm using for my cement is also acting up here. Ideally, you'd want it to just kind of like mist over the area like the isopropyl is. Uh, but for whatever reason, that one just doesn't want to do that and is kind of just giving me squirts instead of a proper uh, spread. Still works, it's just not ideal because uh, the spread can have just enough pressure to actually move stuff out of alignment from where you want it. But not that big a deal, at least not for this project. Right, I've primed it at this point uh, with a nice uh, kind of gray uh, white color uh, and I'm going to start painting uh, using a combination of uh, uh, alcohol inks. Uh, these are just artist inks that you can pick up at Blick or Michaels or any art supply store. Uh, and I generally do like uh, I want to say one-to-one -one alcohol water just to thin it down quite a bit. And it's kind of creating a, a wash to a degree uh, or a bit like uh, Games Workshop's contrast paints where you've got a very thin, uh, heavily pigmented color. And I'm just kind of letting that run down through uh, wherever I'm brushing. So I'm going on kind of heavy, just letting gravity and capillary action do the trick to uh, give me the, the pigmentation that I want in these areas. I'm starting off with a, a kind of a reddish clay brown because uh, I'm aiming to make this look very Texas or American Southwest um, ground terrain, uh, which in those areas, if you dig down a lot, you'll not even very far, you'll just start getting clay. Um, so it makes sense for a riverbed to be very heavily clay-based uh, exposure. Uh, the rest of the areas will have more of a dirt look to it, but... Tex 
boxes, like. If I was doing like a Florida-based one, it would very much be like sand and then, oh god, more water. Uh, but if it's elsewhere in the country, it's going to be more of a, a brown dirt look pretty consistently down everywhere. This is kind of a yellow okra that I'm adding in now, uh, which I believe is more of my primary color for this groundwork. And again, it's all watered down. Uh, capillary action pulls it down into the, the recesses and helps mix together. Uh, and it's one of those things that it looks really bad to start with. And then as you build up your layers of it and let it dry, uh, it starts to really pop and come out together. And you're like, oh, thank God that worked. Uh, but So don't be too afraid if you do this and you don't get the results that you want right away. Keep working with it. Uh, let it sit for a bit. Let it dry. Come back. See where you can improve. Uh, and now I'm using more of a dark brown to get a lot more shading in there. And this is more of my my proper dark dirt top areas. And I am primarily using a hand brush for this to get the, the effect that I want. Uh, you could do it with an airbrush, but I find that for these more natural rock looks, you want to at least do an initial uh, hand brush uh, portion of it to get the, uh, the drips and the recesses uh, to make it look a bit more natural. Uh, you may also notice I'm using just a, a cheap garbage Tamiya brush because uh, this doesn't need to be precision. This isn't something where you go dig out your proper, you know, miniature hand painting brushes or anything. You just a decently sized flat brush is a good uh, tool for this job. And again, it's not precision work, it's just kind of splatter it and see what happens. Now mixing up a bit of gray, just black, white ink, some water. There's not much to it. It's just gray. And this picks up a bit, gives you a bit more of the, the, the regular rock, rock color that you come to expect, like more of a slate, I guess. Uh, 
you don't want to really go too heavy with this any spot but it also adds a bit more shading as well to it darkening some areas adding a bit more visual interest And now to finish it off, I'll be airbrushing the larger sections. And I'm just using the exact same uh, stuff that I was using earlier. Uh, it just now I'm doing it with an airbrush uh, just to get these larger, more flat areas colored in quickly. And the nice thing about these artist inks is that you don't actually need to thin them any to airbrush with them. Uh, they'll just straight out of the bottle airbrush great. Uh, and they just clean up with isopropyl alcohol. And as you can see, I do go over some of the spots I had done previously with the more washy inks. Uh, and I do just try to blend the colors together a bit. This is all stuff I could have done hand brushing as well. Uh, it's just a little bit quicker to do it with the airbrush. Uh -huh. So I opted for that rather than spend another couple hours uh, doing it with the hand brush. Finishing up the airbrushing with some more lighter brown, uh, just to make sure of white and brown. Uh, actually using the Monument Hobby uh, Pro Acrylics for this one. Uh, and then dry brushing on to where I want the rock facings to be uh, with a bit of actual gray uh, and for these last little sections i use regular hobby paints uh, just because they're a bit thicker and they work a bit better for these specific purposes i don't quite want it to blend as much as the the alcohols will blend together uh, i just need that extra thickness to really cover the surface area and just lots of dry brushing uh, dry brushing is a very easy technique. You just take a bit of paint on your brush, you brush it off on a paper towel so you don't really have too much there, and you uh, lightly brush over the edges of your subject, uh, and it just picks up the highlights and gives you a really nice effect. Uh, so here you can see uh, I've got the models back in place to try to give me an idea of where everything's going to go, and I'm using some... Uh, flock uh, tufts from army painter and these just go on with a little bit of pva glue got a big bottle of elmers here for that purpose uh, and i'm not going to cover the entire board with these i'm just going to kind of pick out select spots and i've got uh i think five different types of tufts that I'm using and just kind of mixing together, spreading out to give me a variety of color and style of grasps. Uh, because again, this is intended to be more American Southwest. There's not going to be a huge lot of plant life, especially near 
uh, a military encampment. You're going to have a lot of soldiers walking around, stepping in through the grass, killing it with fumes and chemicals from the maintenance on the, the mobile suits and any other vehicles that they happen to have. Just lots of wear and tear. But there will be the occasional scruffy bit of grass that just persists. Now that uh, pretty much everything else in the ground layer is done, it's going to be time to start the, the water effects. Uh, so you can see here that I am using some painter's tape to tape the two ends of the creek uh, as kind of like stoppers. Uh, now these dams are uh, pretty easy to do, but they are always a little bit risky. Um, you put you just put painters tape down. You trim the edges a bit to get you close to where the edge of your actual project is, and then you're going to want to smear uh, wood glue uh, around the edges of the tape and the board to create kind of a seal. As you can see, I'm just using another disposable brush to uh, really spread that in good. Uh, and you want to make sure that you let the glue and the tape adhere for quite a bit uh, before you start your actual resin pour. Uh, I believe I gave this a good like three hours uh, to fully dry before actually starting with the, the resin. Uh, and then I moved a piece of cardboard underneath the project to hopefully catch any spills if anything leaks out because you never know you never know exactly how watertight you made the uh the board uh now uh what i'm using here is a uh, two-part epoxy resin from upstart uh, epoxy uh these very nice uh clear resin intended for countertops uh I really like using countertop resin for my water effects over the stuff from, say, Woodland Scenics. Uh, as I know that this will dry clear, uh, it's intended to never be affected by UV, uh, so it should not yellow in the end. Uh, and it should end up drying very hard and durable, uh, so I don't have to worry about it cracking or breaking when I move the diorama around or take it to shows. Uh, mixing resin for this purpose is pretty easy. Uh, it's just a one-to-one -one mixture. And for this, I added a very, very small amount of uh, pigment to the mixture as well to give it uh, a slight dirty brown water color. Uh, 
it's kind of hard to say exactly how much uh, you really need to add to it, but it's way less than you think you do. Uh, like, even a drop is probably too much. I just kind of get a bit onto a uh, popsicle stick by rubbing it the edge of the bottle top and then mixing that into it to, to give me the ever so slight hint of color. It's very easy to put too much pigment into a, a resin mixture, uh, at which point you basically have to start over from scratch because um, you can't you can't pull pigment out. Uh, once you're mixed in a good amount, you just pour it into your display, uh, and it will self-level a bit, uh, so you don't have to worry about that too much. But you do want to make sure your table is at least level to begin with. Here I'm going over the surface with a heat gun. Uh, this draws up any bubbles in the mixture to the surface, makes them pop. Uh, and you want to make sure you do this for probably about the first half hour. Just go back over it every now and then with the heat gun, pop any bubbles, make sure you get it all out to not ruin your effect in the end. Generally, you don't want to pour more than about an eighth of an inch at any given time because it will affect the curing process. Uh, and that's an eighth of an inch deep. Uh, length doesn't matter. You can pour as long as as long or wide as you want. It's just the depth that uh, can be problematic. Uh, if you need to do a deeper pour than that, you can do it in sections or layers. Uh, Generally, every four to six hours, you can add another layer easily. Uh, after that point, you need to sand the surface, clean it up with some mineral spirits, and then you can pour your next layer uh, because it will just have cured too much. Uh, it is a 24-hour cure time on this before it becomes completely rock solid, uh, but it does take about like I said, four or six hours, and it's mostly solid at that point. You'd be able to add a second layer to it. Uh, if you can, you want to try to cover your project with either a box or a bin or something at this point uh, to prevent any dust or animal hair from getting into the resin while it's curing. Uh, worst case, just make sure to close all your doors and not to prevent anybody from getting in. Uh, do make sure to you uh, to have uh, good ventilation though while doing this. Uh, it's not necessarily super toxic. It is very fumey though, and it will have quite a smell that lingers for some time while it's curing. Uh, As you can see here, the resin is drying pretty nicely. Uh, nice, smooth level. No leaks. Always thankful for no leaks. Now that it's been 24 hours, you can see that the, the water has fully dried. It's got kind of a nice uh, ambery yellow, dirty watercolor to it. Uh, while still being pretty clear. And for the next section, I'm going to be adding uh, some waves to give more of a realistic look because it's not going to just stay uh, perfectly level in nature. There's going to always going to be at least a slight breeze. And to do this, uh, I use some Mod Podge gloss uh, and I just kind of smear it over the surface and then I hit it with an air gun uh, to just give me some ripples and uh, wave effects. Uh, it's very subtle. Uh, it takes a, quite a bit to to do the full thing. Uh, and you just keep adding more and more Mod Podge as you go along to to give you this effect. And as it dries, it will turn clear. Uh, but while it's uncured, it's this nice white color. It makes it very easy to see 
what you've done, where you need to do more, where you need to work on it. And yeah, just slather the, the Mod Podge all over the surface. Uh, hit it with the spray gun. Just bam, bam, bam. Works great. Uh, and if you need to go back later and you're like, ah, oh, I don't really like how it looks in this area, you can actually peel the Mod Podge gloss off the top of the, the resin surface uh, and re completely redo it, or you can add a bit more and just kind of build it up to create bigger waves. But since this is just a creek, I want to kind of keep it to be pretty shallow waves. Lastly is peeling off the tape on the edges. Uh, and I take a hobby knife to the the edge of the water effect uh, just because there will be a slight lip there from where the resin has cured. And it can be kind of sharp, uh, so this just bevels it out, smooths it out, makes it uh, nice and decent. Let the Mod Podge cure for about 24 hours and you've got nice watery, wavy uh, effect. Uh, and at this point, the uh, base of the diorama is complete. Uh, I will, of course, be painting the Zaku and the figures, and I'll probably be building a small bridge to go over that, uh, over the river. Uh, but that's all stuff for another time. Uh, I hope you've enjoyed this tutorial. Uh, and if you'd like to see more stuff like this, uh, make sure to follow me on YouTube and Twitter. Uh, I'm, again, Cyporian. Uh, if you have any questions about any of the techniques that I've used in this video, or you want to know how something is done in more specifics, uh, feel free to reach out, send me a message. I'm always happy to help people learn. Uh, you can also check out uh, Gunpla 101. I do a number of articles on there, and I'll be doing one as well as a written for a written tutorial on how to do water effects. Thanks for watching.